Well, let's look at his uh, historical context. Um, one of the re re reasons it was kind of groovy to do this PowerPoint is that you can go online and get all kinds of great Edwardian pictures of, of people, right? Doesn't that look like something from upstairs, downstairs? <laughs> this is the Lewis household, uh, and Jack Lewis is in the sailor suit, right? They're in the middle of the front. His brother is on his right, and some cousin, I believe, is on his left. Um, there's the servants, and mom and dad are there. Mom Lewis, uh, uh, upper right, with a really big hat and Dad Lewis, uh, um, uh, uh, middle left, or middle right, okay. Um, he's indirectly the child of an Anglican rectory. His grandfather, his, his maternal grandfather, was the, was the, the rector of the, the nearby church. It's, um, uh, it's pictured uh, down below. Uh, Lewis was baptized in that church in the suburbs of, of Belfast. Uh, within his family, you saw all kinds of um, tensions that were in the Anglican church at that time, and indeed, even today, High church, low church, what they called broad church or middle way, Anglican. Uh, he's exposed to all of them. Um, uh, he is a Vict an Edwardian who would probably was more attached to the Victorian age. But even in the Edwardian age at the turn of the 20th century, Lewis was not the only person who believed in the rational and moral inferiority of women. Almost everybody did. Right? That's why there were so few women's colleges at Oxford. That's why once the, they got about four colleges at Oxford, Lewis voted with the rest of the male faculty at Oxford not to allow any more women's colleges at Oxford. Right? It would dilute the quality. It would turn us into, he said, a woman's university. Okay? But he, would, he was not the only person who thought that way. That was just, you know, that was, that was life back then. All right? Um, certainly in the middle class, there was what we call the doctrine of separate spheres, that men were made for the public sphere, the academy, the, the, the political forum. Um, uh, the army, the navy, that kind of thing. Women were meant for the private sphere, the domestic sphere. Uh, but notice, too, that this gets all mixed up with social classes, right? So gender and, and social class are, 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 in, are, are, mixed, are, are, are confounded in an interesting way. So that the earlier Lewis has no problems whatsoever having, uh, you know, having women colleagues teaching women students at Oxford, even though he doesn't want too many of them there. But he's not, a, he's not a fan of public education, right? The state schooling system is starting to get bigger and bigger here, and he thinks this is just going to dilute everything, right? Sure, there are a minority of women who deserve to be at Oxford, but if we open the gates of education to everyone, male and female, including lower class people, you know, then England is going to go down the tubes, okay? So, you know, so there are class and gender considerations that, again, are not unique to Lewis. Right? This is, this is the, pretty much the way people in, his, in, his, in his, his, his class thought in the Victorian and Edwardian age. For instance, Hannah Moore, who was part of the Clapham sect, and the Clapham sect, sect was an evangelical Anglican sect. They really worked hard to teach the lower classes how to read. They were the ones that, 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 that um, brought Sunday schools into being in England, and the Sunday schools weren't just to learn Bible stories. They were to teach uh, the poor people how to read as well. And part of it was because they thought, you know, we've got to have a, we've got to have a, more edu a slightly more educated lower class because we don't want what happened in France to happen in England. We don't want anything like the French Revolution to happen in England. But in spite of that great work that the, the Clapham sect was doing in helping the poor and, 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 and at least teaching them how to read the Bible, here's what Hannah Moore said. Beautiful is the order of society when each according to his own place pays willing honor to his superiors. When servants are prompt to obey their masters and masters deal kindly with their servants, when high and low, rich and poor, when landlord and tenant, master and workman, um, minister and people sit down satisfied each with his own place. Uh, how many know the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, All Creatures Great and Small? You know the verse we don't sing anymore? The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God, God put them in their places and ordered their estate. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, etc. Not in the hymn books anymore. All right? Okay. All right, uh, this is sort of fun. I just give you the Belfast Irish connection to show you where Lewis lived. Uh, again, my, my um, uh, laser pointer isn't, isn't, isn't bright enough to work here, but you have to go across the river uh, in, the, in the upper left uh, picture to, to, the, to Strandtown, the, 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 the suburb where Lewis was raised. Uh, the, 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 the house in the upper right is, um, is Little Lee, the house where he, uh, he, he grew up. Um, I give you this picture of uh, a Belfast street, which I took in 2005, because it looks in the distance to the Castlery Hills. And these are the hills that Lewis looked at as a child and gave him that feeling of longing, right? That gave him that feeling that there was of, of, of almost pain, right? That, that said there's something more than there is to this life, right? So he certainly was, a, you know, was, was a, a, not, a, not a nature worshiper, but a nature lover and a, something of a nature mystic. 
Uh, and I just give you the map to show you, these are, these are the ferry routes between uh, uh, England and, and Northern Ireland, because Lewis always went back to Northern Ireland uh, during his vacations and, and caught up with his family and did some traveling and some hiking. And then he would take one, or, one of those routes to get back to, uh, to probably Liverpool, mostly, and then got on the train and went down to, down to Oxford. Um, he has a lot to say, say in some of his letters uh, about the, the controversy over the, over, over the uh, independence of Northern Ireland, whether it's going to join Southern Ireland or whether it's going to stay with England. It's a Catholic Protestant controversy. These are orange men, in your, in your face orange men, all right, Protestant orange men who are walking in a Catholic neighborhood and, uh, and playing, you know, playing militant songs. Uh, at the lower left, we see, believe it or not, all these um, pallets are being assembled for a huge 12th of July bonfire. And the orange men are going to celebrate uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the ma maintenance of the connection with, with England. And in the lower right, we have, um, actually, this is at a Belfast library. This is Lewis looking into a wardrobe. Now, it's only a, it's only a, uh, it's only a, um, uh, a copy of the one true wardrobe, which some of you may know is at Wheaton College. Right? The one true wardrobe, as in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. That's at Wheaton College, and I did some of my research for the book at Wheaton College, and I'd be sitting at a desk, and these little kids would run by me and say, where is it, where is it? <laughs> it's because, because an English professor, named Clyde Kilby, you know, got in on the ground floor when Lewis's estate was being divided up, and he got, they got a lot of Lewis's books, and, and indeed the one true wardrobe, and they started the Wade Center, which is a, a, a center devo devoted to the writings of C.S. Lewis and six other uh, Christian writers of his era. All right, okay, so uh, let's talk about um, Lewis's uh, historical context in terms of his intellectual pedigree. I've said he was a classicist, a medieval and Renaissance sc scholar. I've already said he was influenced by Plato, by Aristotle, by Milton, and by the medieval cosmology you see in the, um, in the upper, upper, upper left. There's the medieval great chain of being. They've got at the top, angels a little bit below, uh, demons, then man. Oh, and hello, women below man, right? Aristotle said women are less rational than men, and because they are less rational, they are necessarily less moral, because rationality is what leads to good moral judgments, okay? Uh, and then plants and animals and so on. Uh, Aristotle called this the scale of naturae, the ladder of nature. Um, it was called the medieval great chain of being, and Lewis wrote about it a lot in his preface to Paradise Lost, Paradise Lost being one of, uh, one of um, Milton's great poems. So in a sense, um, although he doesn't use this, well, he doesn't, you, you know the, the popular book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, right? My favorite bumper sticker says, Men Are From Earth, Women Are From Earth, get used to it. Um, <laughs> so, so, so Lewis did not write the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. It was ri written, by, written by a guy who knows nothing about psychology by the name of John, uh, John Gray, um, uh, and, and has done no research and quotes no research to support his thesis. But you know, if you've read the Space Trilogy, you know that it, 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 hooks, it, hooks, it hooks onto that medieval great chain of being in the sense that he sees the planets as being gendered. Mars is a masculine planet, and the first of the Space Trilogy is out of the silent planet, and, and Ransom, the Christ figure, is kidnapped and is taken to Mars. Perilandra is about Venus, which is a, is a feminine planet, and that hideous strength is back on Earth, and it's a kind of a, rewrite, a rewriting of the Tower of Babel story, okay? But so gender is a very, very, gender and the, the essence, what he thinks is the essence of masculinity and femininity runs through that whole early space trilogy. Um, uh, what we need to understand as well though is that because Lewis subscribed to this um, uh, medieval great chain of being, it led him to have Arian tendencies. You know what the Arian heresy was? Uh, it's the idea that, that Christ is not co-equal with God, right? When we look at pictures of the Trinity, they're often symbolized by three interlocking uh, um, uh, circles on the same on the same level, right? But the, the Arians thought that that Christ was not on the same level as God, right? That he was down down the chain a bit. Well, that's the the Nicene Creed, as we may, Professor Carey has told us in many of his writings, was put together uh, in the Athanasian Creed, you know, in order to overcome that heresy. It's very clear that Lewis had Arian tendencies, and you can see why. All right, this this this, this might happen. He, by the way, by the time he writes the discarded image, he's discarded those tendencies, but he does have them early on.